Hi, I'm Chester Wisniewski, Principal Research Scientist at Sophos. I'm um, bringing a presentation to you today called Building Defensive Playbooks from Others' Misfortune. And what I'm trying to do here is share from a lot of other folks' experiences a bit of what has led them to become victims so that we can try to kind of extract from that the most common ways or the common mistakes that organizations are making, how we might learn from that to improve our own defensive playbooks. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to join you all in the Philippines. I'm really happy to be able to present. This is my first RootCon, and hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to be with you in the future to, uh, to join you in person. But uh, for now, we're gonna we're gonna do, go with Zoom. I want to give you a little background info, just briefly. Um, uh, Sophos, we're a global security company. If you're not familiar with us, and where this information is coming from is a lot of my experience working with our customers, our partners, uh, all around the world, and you know we're. We're working with over 500,000 companies, so we have this incredibly rich set of data that we can work from to kind of take the pulse, if you will, of what's going on in information security, and it's incredibly helpful. And my job at the company is actually to liaise with all of our researchers around the world. So, you know, we've got over 200 people in our research labs, uh, Sophos XOps, and, you know, some of them are working on artificial intelligence, and some of them work on web threats, and some of them work on malware, and, you know, some of them work on email protection, all these different things. And so... I have the privilege of kind of working with all those folks to collect sort of the most interesting things and trends that they're all observing in their small little micro areas where they're really deep experts and then taking all that information and kind of putting it together to get a better understanding of the big picture of what's really happening in information security to real organizations and not just the stuff we have a tendency to hear about in the headlines. I think we're all really super fascinated with the news headlines when we hear about a really sophisticated hack. But of course, most of the time, that's not actually what's happening to the average organization out there. And uh, it's sexy and cool and interesting. And we all love hearing about the latest zero day vulnerability at our security conferences. But the truth of the matter is InfoSec day to day is quite different than that. And uh, being able to look at all the bits of information we get from all around the world is helping paint a much more detailed picture of what's really happening to organizations so that um, those of us fortunately that have enough security staff that care can start to take some notes from that and learn from it to hopefully improve our own security. So uh, this most of this information I'm talking about today is from what we call our active adversary playbook that we published recently. And this covered uh, 144 incidents where somebody was impacted by malware and our incident response team was able to go in, determine what happened, do all the forensics, write the report, uh, and extract from that sort of uh, the, the, the details or the root cause analysis of what caused this breach to begin with and what kind of damage was done and what, what behaviors were employed by the attackers, that kind of thing. And you can see it's quite diverse, although, you know, by country, if you look at the pie chart there, you know, the vast majority uh, of the victims, more than half are from the United States. Uh, knowing that we're presenting here in the Philippines, um, Philippines is two of the 144 cases, which is why Philippines listed there as 1%. So obviously it's not specific to the Philippines, but one of the interesting things that came of this actually, looking at it uh, from a global perspective with the, the, the report's author, was we didn't see really any variability globally, like about the kind of mistakes people were making, or we didn't see the criminals behave in a different way when they attacked a German bank than when they attacked an American manufacturing facility. Most of these attacks uh, are pretty much all from the same attacker playbook, if you will. And it really doesn't matter what the geography of the victim is. In fact, about the only thing that is really different about victims in different countries, at least amongst this data set, is the price that ransom was paid. Uh, clearly, the, the Americans were targeted with the highest ransom dollar amounts, and other countries proportionally were often smaller dollar amounts based on their ability to pay. But uh, beyond that, there isn't a lot of difference when we look at it by country. Now, we will see quite a lot of difference when we look at it by the size of an organization. I mean, you can see the distribution uh, of the customers here is largely under 5,000, right? There's a, uh, only a couple, uh, I think it was three in the data set that were over 5,000. Most of the organizations here are between um, uh, one and 3,000 employees, but it's quite evenly distributed amongst them. So there, there's, there's enough data there that it does actually get kind of interesting to see how different sized organizations are able to respond and detect uh, to uh, infection incidents, largely ransomware. And again, quite diverse when we look by sector, 
there, there are some variations by sector in this data set. It's quite small, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about sectors. But if you kind of project from your own um, uh, intuition of which organizations are likely best and worst, you're probably correct. Based on other research sets that I commonly work with in my role day to day, uh, organizations that are in finance and military defense are often at the least victimized end of the spectrum. And organizations like uh, municipal governments or cities, uh, school districts, and healthcare organizations that have very tight budgets don't invest a lot in security often are victimized more frequently. So I'm going to start out the first half of our presentation today talking about how we fail. In order to learn from how we're failing and figure out the things that are going to be most effective to prevent the failure, we need to kind of do a bit of navel gazing and look into why we're failing to begin with. So uh, if, as we look into the root causes of attacks, there's a lot of ways to look at this information now. My, my least favorite thing about this statistic here on the screen is that unknown is 36%. And that sounds bad, but I'll explain it in a little more detail. Clearly, the most obvious thing here is exploited vulnerability is almost exactly half of the incidents that we investigate. And while there's some variability in what those vulnerabilities are, none of them uh, in our experience in any of this data set were zero days. They were all patched vulnerabilities that just had not been patched by the organization. They may have been partially patched in some instances where perhaps they had five exchange servers and one of them got missed in applying patches. Uh, they might not have been patched at all, which was much more common with things like VPN concentrators or remote access devices. Uh, but all of those patches were had been available for some time and, and in many cases, uh, months or even years. Now, the ones other than unknown, uh, phishing, brute force, and compromised credentials, you could kind of lump together because they're all about stealing passwords, whether they did it through a phishing attack or whether they got the password from the LinkedIn data breach eight years ago, or whether they just simply guessed passwords in a brute force attack. In the end, those were all from compromised credentials, let's call it, and put them together uh, in that sort of 16% there. The 1% the that's download is almost entirely uh, email threats, right? So when we say download, we think of going to perhaps a malicious website, but it's usually not that. Uh, the email leads you to a link where ultimately you download the malicious code because uh, typically organizations have much stronger security at their email gateway. Like every email attachment goes through a filter. But as many of us work remotely, especially since the on, onset of COVID and things, it, not every user necessarily has a web filter in front of them. One day they may when they're in the office and another day they may be at a cafe and another day they may be at home on their own Wi-Fi. And so the universal uh, application of web filtering is not as, uh, as applied there as it is for email. Every one of my emails gets scanned but only some of my web traffic gets scanned. So it's, it, the criminals have caught on to that and don't use necessarily as malicious attachments as much anymore as they might redirect you to a web link where there's a malicious ending uh, for you to download something as opposed to sending as an attachment. Now that 36% unknown is sort of a legal thing. We never came to a legal conclusion as to how the incident started, but the vast majority of those we believe were compromised credentials. Um, so we can kind of assume that probably 80% or more of those, in my understanding, were believed to be compromised credentials, but we couldn't identify where the credential was stolen. And so in our official reports, we were never able to tell the victim necessarily that this was for sure uh, a stolen admin password, for example. So they do remain unknown. But personally, I feel that if we have to rank the things that cause these attacks, it's absolutely number one is vulnerabilities. And then right behind it is some sort of stolen credential, whether it was phished or whether it was a reused password or something similar. And then in distant third, it's some sort of email born threat, whether it was an attachment or them leading to a download. And there's almost no other uh, things that uh, cause these attacks. That's that's kind of all, pretty much gives you the 100%. So another thing to see here, and I think this is pretty interesting, is the attacker dwell time. And uh, in most of these statistics throughout the presentation, I'm going to quote the median dwell time. And if you don't remember that from when we were in mathematics in grade school, if you take the average, of course, you're taking some extremes into account that have a tendency to sway where what that number is. So for example, the longest dwell time was over 420 days that attackers were in a network in one of the victims. 
And the shortest dwell time was about 90 minutes. And when we put all those together, it has a tendency to uh, skew the, the number for, away from what the truth is and what we actually see in victims day to day. So what we look at is instead the median, which is the middle number of the entire data set. And when we look at the median, it was about 15 days uh, that the, the criminals were inside the victims network before either the malware was triggered like ransomware where an encryption happened or when the victim determined that an attacker was in and kicked them out, but little over two weeks. When we're talking about non-ransomware though, that number jumps up to 34 days. So I, I think this is kind of interesting, which is, you know when a ransomware attack has happened because it's in your face, right? You, you get a note with a skull and crossbones demanding your money. So it's not like it's something you don't know happened. At, there's some end point that you clearly have detected it, whether you were looking or not. Whereas uh, if I infect your Linux servers, the, your web servers, maybe something in the cloud with a crypto miner, I'm going to largely stay there as long as I possibly can. And you may not notice, it may not cause enough performance degradation. It may be that you get a bill from Amazon for $10,000 and you go, oh my God, why is that so high? And now you find the crypto where. So it's interesting to me that it's 34 days because it's just more than a month. It literally is like one billing period of your Azure or your AWS that you were infected. And then of course that was your tip off that something was terribly wrong when you got this big bill for making Ethereum. And uh, I'm not saying all of those are crypto miners, but when we take out ransomware from the data set, the remaining ones are largely crypto miners, info stealers, and a few other things. Ransomware is uh, clearly the dominant uh, malware in the data set. And if it turns out they're stealing your data. Let's say you're able to detect it at that point. I'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation because I think it's a good thing to target as another last chance opportunity to stop an attack in progress before it's too late. Uh, it's four days on average between when they start siphoning off all your sensitive files to when they trigger the ransomware and start encrypting everything. So there's still a reasonable amount of time there. If you're good at threat hunting and you're actively watching for bad things that may be happening within your network, these times um, sound terrible, but to me, these are optimistic. I'm going, I've got two whole weeks to look for threat indicators before bad things are likely to happen. So uh, if I'm doing this well, that's plenty of time for my team to be able to detect and respond to an incident before the worst happens. And uh, even if I only detect it at the point that they've already started compromising and stealing my data, potentially, I still have time before the ransom hits, which is even worse. I mean, I, it's bad enough to have data theft, but it's even worse when they encrypt it afterwards. So uh, that's, that's interesting. And, you know, there's stats there at the bottom that kind of give you some more details across different types of organizations and, Clearly, there's some size differences, ransomware differences, all this kind of thing. But uh, the, you know, the variability, I think, is somewhat predictable. Um, unfortunately, schools and educational institutions seem to be infected for the longest uh, periods of time and often uh, with multiple attackers, which is a, a, a whole separate problem where you may have something like cryptoware, crypto ransomware, uh, crypto mining for a month. And then afterwards, another criminal comes in using the same vulnerability and causes a, a, a layered attack, if you want to call it that. Small businesses struggle with this, and it, it, it's interesting that it's almost directly proportional to size. And there's two reasons for this. Uh, in our experience, the under 500 person companies do not have full-time security staff that is empowered to be spending time threat hunting, right? They're so small that they're spending all of their time trying to fight fires and there's no proactive activity occurring within those victims to allow them to detect that they've been compromised. The bigger companies do have full-time security staff. So that certainly uh, slows or speeds up their detection times. But even more than that, the criminals may send out a, an email spam with a malicious attachment and collect 100 victims. Well, they're going to target the bigger organizations first because they have more money. 
And so they they naturally go to the larger victims uh, to collect larger ransoms. And then when they run out of large victims, they eventually get around two or three or four weeks later to then targeting those smaller organizations for smaller amounts of money if they don't have an influx of new victims. So th there's a few different explanations. But um, to me, this was quite expected that small companies struggle with detection times much more than large organizations. So why is this dwell time, you know, so high and so variable? And I think one of the big reasons is uh, what are now being referred to as initial access brokers. And if you're not familiar with that terminology, in essence, what it is, is there's a whole group of criminal specialists these days that specialize in just getting their foot in the door, whether that's the malicious attachment to get a bot onto a computer, whether it's uh, phishing credentials, whatever it is, once they have that, they then sell that access onto other criminals to the highest bidder. And they may get more money for a victim in country X versus country Y. They may get more money for a company with 5,000 employees instead of 1,000 employees. Um, perhaps if they have administrative access, they get more money for that victim than one without administrative access. But there's entire forums out there dedicated to selling access to other criminals to take advantage of access that's been gained. And this is a screenshot from a portal that just went offline not very long ago, but uh, is no longer available, but it was called UAS RDP shop. They specialized in selling remote desktop protocol access to victims all over the world. You can see an example on the right-hand side of the screen listing all the critical things you need to know about a company you might wanna buy access to, which country they're in, uh, if, if they have a postal code that might indicate their region, they tell you that, what operating system, how much memory, how much bandwidth up, how much bandwidth down. Um, does, can you get directly to it via its IP? Is it like directly on the open internet or do I have to come in through some sort of proxy to get administrative rights? Uh, or does it have admin rights or is it just a non-privileged user? And you can see the prices are variable by the countries. Uh, I think the most expensive one you see here on the screen is Hong Kong for $19 for a machine that has admin access in Hong Kong. Uh, whereas other ones which don't have admin access are a little cheaper and it, it all depends on the country um, that the victim might be in. And of course, these types of services are available to sell access, not just to RDP, but to secure shell on Linux machines and Unix machines uh, and, and lots of other uh, uh, remote access products, uh, LogMeIn, TeamViewer, VNC, all these types of things. And so I think this is one of the reasons we see such a high dwell time sometimes. These initial access brokers will send out thousands and tens of thousands and millions of phishing emails. And they may net several hundred or thousand victims that fall for their attack. And they put them up in these stores. And then depending on what country that victim's in or how wealthy that company may be, they're going to be uh, on the shelf for purchase for different amounts of time. And uh, that certainly contributes to some of that variability and long dwell times that we see where no malware has really been deployed necessarily on the victim's network. They're just sitting on the shelf waiting for a criminal to purchase them. Legitimate and tools also increase some of the stealthiness. I think this is another reason smaller organizations really struggle with detection. And this isn't about detecting malware so much anymore because so much of what we detect is legitimate. Uh, if you look at this list from the report, uh, you know, PowerShell, like who doesn't have PowerShell on their network? I mean, it's almost impossible to administrate Windows without writing some PowerShell. And uh, malicious scripts is everything not PowerShell, but that's largely uh, traditional uh, scripts, Python scripts, JavaScripts, you know, this kind of stuff. Microsoft PS exec, Cobalt Strike, you know, legitimate pen testing tool. Then we get into stuff that's a little more dicey. Like hopefully your security products should be trying to detect things like web shells. But then you have like legitimate Microsoft tools like net, uh, net.exe. So, um, you know, Mimi cats clearly, you know, again, malicious software tools uh, or security tools should detect malicious software like Mimi cats. But uh, the vast majority of this is not something that your antivirus is going to alert on, right? You, you need to have a different approach to application control. You need to have a different approach to how you uh, think about um, whether these legitimate tools when they're in use should be in use, right? Like I don't think the average end user should have net.exe probably being executed in a shell on their machine. Like most people aren't gonna know what that is. Why is the woman in accounting or the, the man in tech support running that tool? And there's indicators when it 
it's appropriate when it's not, but this is not the old days of antivirus saying this thing is good and this thing is bad. Well, these things are good and bad, right? Like one of the first things a lot of times we see in an incident is the criminal runs, who am I when they compromise a computer? They literally don't know what account they might've compromised when they exploit a vulnerability in your web server. And they need to know who they are. Well, no legitimate person doesn't know who they are. It has to ask the computer, like, who am I? I mean, that's a pretty big indicator that something terrible is going on. But if you're not watching for it, um, it'll go unnoticed. And it's a legitimate tool, right? It's part of Windows. Other indicators from our study, 73% uh, of these incidents involve ransomware, right? So, I mean, literally three quarters of the things, that, the attacks that are large enough that somebody has to reach out and ask for help from a group of professionals, three out of four times, it's ransomware. And once they get into your network, 82% of the time, they hop from computer to computer using RDP. And this... This is a really tough problem to solve, right? So most of us are listening and stopped exposing RDP to the open internet. Uh, this year's research showed it, it was down to 1%. So of, of the cases that we demonstrated, almost none of them started with RDP from the outside. But once the criminals got a foothold on the inside, it was all RDP in the vast majority, four out of five cases. Uh, and, and the problem is like, you could disable the RDP service, you could turn it off. But the criminals, once they have administrative rights, they just turn it back on because it's really convenient. And they'll just issue a GPO and tell Windows, turn RDP on everywhere on the network, or at least maybe turn RDP on on all the servers anyway, because those servers are where all the, the data is that they're interested in stealing and encrypting. So uh, that trend is continued and it's a really hard trend to combat because we have seen the criminals in networks where it's been disabled, just go, oh, they turned it off. I guess I have to turn it back on. And they do. Uh, if we look at dwell time again, though, you can kind of sort the top and bottom of that chart. So the top of that chart is stuff that you implant so that you can come back later, sort of a back door, a way to get in. Very common amongst these initial access brokers. I need a way to get back onto this network so I can sell this victim. Screen Connect, AnyDesk, Cobalt Strike, Web Shells, this kind of stuff. The small bars at the bottom of the chart, the bottom, say, two thirds of the chart or so, um, those are things that you're doing while you're hacking the network. Right. Like I'm, I'm now got a human with hands on the keyboard and I'm in the middle of hacking you. I'm modifying the registry to turn things on and off. I'm running malicious scripts. I'm turning off your antivirus or your endpoint security. I'm creating new administrative accounts. Right. I'm scheduling tasks to say run the ransomware in three days at midnight when everybody's gone home for the weekend that type of activity. So the, the ones that we can watch for to be an indicator earlier in the compromise before the attackers are actively trying to compromise and steal our data is that first set of things, remote access tools, pen testing tools, web shells. Those are the things that are persistent that we have time to detect before the bad stuff happens. This was fascinating to me. My colleague, John Shire, uh, did an analysis of the date that the customer was compromised compared to the date that these vulnerabilities were publicly disclosed with a proof of concept. So whether that was a Metasploit module or somebody publishing a proof of concept on GitHub or Twitter, and it's it's not a coincidence that the vast majority of victims are compromised literally the day of or within the next two or three days. So if you look at that first vulnerability, Citrix, it was commonly ca uh, called the Citrix vulnerability at the time, somebody not liking the company Citrix. Uh, the day one, days or day zero, if you will, of the proof of concept coming out, huge number of victims. And then it tails off over the next couple of days uh, as, as time passes. And the same is true with uh, proxy logon, proxy shell. Uh, whenever they get publicity and we're all talking about them, suddenly the criminals are out there scanning for any computer on the internet that may have been vulnerable. And this is really a challenge for, especially for servers, VPN concentrators, firewalls, things that most of us are uncomfortable patching day zero, day one. Like very few people have patched exchange servers within a even a week of Patch Tuesday. And for good reason. I mean, exchange is really easy to mess it up. And people, your, your fellow coworkers know when you break email. Like you're, you're, nobody wants to break email. And it might be prudent to wait a week, two weeks to test patching your exchange servers before you do it. Problem is if they're compromising you within 24 to 72 hours, you're already compromised with the web shell before you patch. So 
you need to not just patch. You actually need to go back when you know when it's a known exploited vulnerability. You need to go back and look for evidence that you might have been compromised during the window before you patched. And and I'm not going to argue that you should patch your exchange servers the same day fixes come out because it's it's almost impossible, right? Like most of us are not able to do that, and it may not even be safe to do it. Not all the patches are perfect. But we do need to be very careful about applying mitigations immediately. If Microsoft says, turn the web access off or put it behind a zero trust or put it behind a VPN, or we should be applying those mitigations immediately, even if we can't apply the patches immediately, because these most of these infections are occurring almost immediately once proof of concepts are published. And uh, most of us are patching after those proof of concepts. So we have to figure out a way to kind of bridge that gap. Uh, lastly, exfiltration, right? I mean, the, the criminals don't just encrypt files these days. Uh, they steal them as well to use it as an extortion tactic. We're all actually getting pretty good at backups. More and more customers in all of our surveys when we look at victims have backups and are able to use those backups to recover from a ransomware attack. So the hedge against that for the criminals, of course, is exfiltration. Uh, they're using Active Directory to look for file shares specifically that have finance, HR, IT, budget information, password lists, uh, and legal documents. These are the most lucrative things that they can publish on the dark web to kind of force you to pay. Um, 90% of the time, in my experience, they're using R clone. So if you're not familiar, our great open source tool. I use R clone for my own backups. I didn't even know about it until criminals started using it. And it's this fantastic tool that lets you do things like an R sync or an X copy, but the destination could be a cloud service. You can say, copy this directory or this entire hard drive to an S3 bucket or to Backblaze or to, in the criminal's case, Mega and Google Drive seem to be the preferred ones. Um, the vast majority of victims had data stolen, was copied up to Mega, which is uh, Kim.com's old file sharing service. It used to be called mega.co.nz. Um, it's a, 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 a large file sharing service, quite famous for hosting a lot of pirated content. Um, criminals seem to prefer it, and they use our clone to copy and steal all your data and send it up to Mega. Uh, as a storage place. So this is kind of good for defenders in a small way, which is if you can detect these attacks in progress, the password for the R clone tool to log into Mega is often still on your computer and you can log into Mega and delete all your files <laughs> or recover them yourself. We've actually had victims log into their own stolen information and re-download it after it was encrypted from the criminals before deleting it. So it's not always a lost cause. Not all of these things are bad, but these are certainly indicators to watch for that exfiltration is happening because um, in, in almost all cases, our clone is in use and either uh, Google Drive, Mega, Dropbox, et cetera, are being used to, to host the files on behalf of the criminals. And there's not a lot of exclusivity in this business. Um, when you go to purchase those credentials from initial access broker, a lot of times they'll actually mark them in the forums as to whether they are available uh, exclusively or whether they're selling that access to multiple different criminals. And in this case, we had three different ransomware groups attack the same victim. Uh, if you're interested, we wrote a blog on it. I put the title there at the bottom, Lockbit Hive and Black Cat attack automotive supplier and triple ransomware attack. But um, initially the initial access broker did break in via exposed RDP at the end of 2021. And then we proceeded to see three different ransomware groups log into their systems and encrypt files over the course of uh, about a, a four week period. And it got to the point where the ransomwares were re-encrypting the files while the previous ransomware was still in the process of encrypting other files and they were like stepping on each other to where some of the files were encrypted five different times between the three different ransomware groups. Uh, so it, it got pretty insane, but this is not uncommon. We, we were seeing more and more frequently multiple attackers. Most often we see crypto miner installed after a vulnerability like proxy logon, crypto miner will be there for three months. Then that victim will get sold to a ransomware actor who will then encrypt it. Uh, so that's the most common, but there's been multiple cases in the last year where we've seen at least two and sometimes three different ransomware groups in the same network at the same time. So what do we do, right? Defense is what I promised in the title, how we're going to build a defensive playbook. So analyzing all the mistakes that we made in the first half of the presentation, we can kind of take a look at what are the, what are the most effective things we're going to do to try not to be one of these victims. I joke around that our, our ransomware uh, or our rapid response service is where all this data comes from. And, and I, I, I joke that 
you know, this talk is really about how not to become a customer of our rapid response service. If you can learn why other people ended up being customers, then hopefully we can take actions to not be a customer. And I mean, patching is obvious, but we all know it's a heck of a lot harder than it sounds. And when we look at the vulnerabilities that were exploited in 2021, and this has not changed in 2022, the vast majority are proxy logon, proxy shell, uh, Fortinet VPN, Pulse Secure VPN, Cisco and Citrix vulnerabilities, stuff that's been out for a year, two years, some of it three years now, and still unpatched. And so we kind of have to look like it's important, but we know you can't patch everything. So how do you decide which things you need to be patching versus which things can wait when you don't have enough staff or time to test all the patches? And uh, my kind of key points are here in this slide. If you're not familiar with CISA, it's part of the United States Department of Homeland Security. They publish a known exploited vulnerabilities list for the US government to understand which vulnerabilities to prioritize. And I highly recommend following that. That gives you a list of things that are known to be used by criminals to be actively targeting people. There are tens of thousands of vulnerabilities disclosed every year, but there's only like a hundred that are actually actively attacked by criminals. So you need to focus your attention there. Don't worry about all 20,000. Worry about the ones that we know somebody's targeting. Another mistake I think we make is in the old days, a lot of threats came in through our endpoints, our laptops and our personal computers. The threats are coming in now through infrastructure and servers. So that they have to be the top priority. The criminals golden jewels is to get to the sensitive data on those servers. And almost every one of the attacks in this uh, year's report um, that we just talked about, almost every single one of them, when it was a vulnerability, it was a VPN concentrator or an RDP or an unpatched server, not an endpoint, very rarely an endpoint. So if I've only got small amounts of time to patch, I'm first hitting the servers and making sure they get patched. Then I'm hitting the, the firewalls, the VPNs, all that externally facing infrastructure that we're all afraid to patch because we've all patched a Cisco router and had our config go sideways. I mean, it, it's not fun to do this stuff, but it really does have to be the priority and do them, you know, do them in that order. You got to patch everything if you can get around to it, but order them so that the most important ones start first and understand that Security and IT often have different goals. If you're in a large enough organization that has the privilege of having a security team that's separate from IT, you understand that security's job is to identify these vulnerabilities and figure out which ones are going to likely lead your business to have a problem. IT's job is to actually go out and deploy all those patches, right? And they're very different responsibilities if you're running um, in an organization that has those, those two distinct functions. Uh, so try to be compassionate that those IT people not have to not just patch those vulnerabilities, but they also have to like image laptops and deploy new software and services. And so if as a security person, you can help them with the prioritization, you're both gonna have more mutual success. And not all systems are created equal. Like sometimes it's okay if a system gets compromised compared to another one. And when it really comes down to only having 10 hours to patch and 20 hours worth of things to patch, prioritizing the ones where the most damage is going to occur is, is clearly a priority, uh, especially if you're in a legacy infrastructure um, where, you know, maybe once you're inside the network, you have privileged access, which is true in most organizations still. And we all know that we want to get away from that, but uh, these things take time and prioritization is critical. Looking for what's uh, in ordinary, right? Like, just because it's a legitimate tool doesn't mean it should be on your network. And more importantly, it's about often it's about when it's on your network. Uh, if you know, you probably use most of these tools in some capacity, maybe not Mimi cats, maybe only your red team or your penetration testing company might be using something like Mimi cats, but many of us are using Nmap and PowerShell and even our clone. Like I said, I, I learned about it from the criminals. Like it's a great backup tool. I'm using it to back up my own stuff. So like these are common tools. What we need to look for is what's standing out as um, inordinary. And what I mean by that is a normal person in accounting their computer probably shouldn't be running the angry IP scanner. They probably also shouldn't be running PS exec and they sh certainly shouldn't be running Mimi cats. And you may use our clone, but you may use our clone on a subset of your servers to consolidate your backups. If you see it anywhere else, that's bad, right? Like you, you need to be able to start detecting legitimate tools in the wrong place or the wrong time, because most of these attacks are intentionally off hours to 
hopefully evade detection and on the assumption that maybe you do not have a 24 by 7 security operation. Look for combinations that are odd, right? Um, running who am I and then running a PowerShell script is pretty weird. Like that's not something most people are going to do. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, PowerShell will often download uh, a, a malicious DLL and then run DLL 32 will get run immediately afterwards to load that DLL to start doing malicious things. It's a very common attack pattern that criminals will use. It's a very common attack pattern of tools like Cobalt Strike and Metasploit. That's not something, again, a, a legitimate admin don't do. A, a legitimate admin may use PS exec to do some remote administration. A, a, a legitimate admin's very unlikely to run, run DLL 32 to manually load a DLL into memory. That's just not something that happens. So trying to look for those combinations. And one of the ways you can help manage this is by having a, 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 a change management process. So whether you have your own security operations center or SOC, or whether you're contracting with a third party firm to maybe do managed detection and response on your behalf, it's much easier to do that job when you know when those admin tools are in use. So if you do your changes uh, to your firewalls and your infrastructure and all your patch deployment to your servers on the third Saturday of the month, then the SOC knows on the third Saturday when they see PS exec, it's probably administration, don't worry about it. The IT team came in this Saturday to get things done. Whereas when they see it on the following Monday, they know it's probably a criminal because no changes should be happening that require any of these administrative scripts, PowerShell, PS exec, these things aren't being used outside of the change window when a change has been approved to be applied. And while many of us hate change management, I mean, it's just, it, it's this bureaucracy that gets in our way of doing things the way we want to be able to do them as quickly as possible. If they're really, really helpful for detecting a latent compromise in your network where a legitimate tool is being used for illegitimate purposes. Layers. Now, I this picture is of a young woman who thinks she's hacked the airport security system, which is she doesn't want to pay to check her luggage. So she wore all of her clothes layered one layer after the next after the next so she wouldn't have to pay to check a bag at the airport. I love all kinds of hacking. It doesn't have to be computer hacking. I just thought she is brilliant for not having to pay the $50 bag charge. Um, but obviously when we're talking about layers in security, it's not just defense in depth. And we we all know about defense in depth. And, you know, we should have email security, we should have web security, we should have endpoint security, we should have this, and we should have XDR, we should have all this stuff. Um, but what those layers do in the midst of an attack, they may not always detect everything, but they help you paint a picture of what's going on. You can tell that very large amount of data started going out the firewall only 15 minutes after the PowerShell script launched our clone. And those things together are a lot more meaningful than they are alone. So having those layers helps you paint that picture to see what's really going on in the network. And if you've only got spotty, um, and, and not all those layers are always going to be present. Like I said, you know, when I'm working from home, I'm not behind the Sophos firewall, which is doing web filtering at the office. I'm behind my own access point. And it turns out I happen to have one at home, but most of my employees don't, right? So the more of those layers that we have in place, the more of a complete picture we can understand. And they give us context as to a series of things and how, they, uh, how they've played out. And if you've done a forensic investigation, you understand how important the timeline of events is when you're trying to unravel and get back to the source, the root cause of your problems. And the more of these layers, even when they're not, effective at blocking, like not all the products are always going to detect everything all the time. The human being, when they're reviewing these things, can suddenly get to a much earlier detection, which leads to an earlier eviction, right? We want to evict the criminal from our network and get them out. And the sooner we detect them and evict them, the less damage they're going to be able to cause. And those layers are not just barriers. They're also places of logging, right? We get, we get, we get clues that we can use to paint that picture for the humans to know something's wrong. I, I don't think anybody needs to tell you use multi-factor authentication anymore. Um, like we've all been told 5 million times, uh, but there are particular things to think about when you're approaching multi-factor authentication. Uh, clearly at the top of the screen here, remote access is the number one place you have to start. 
uh, as of the time of this recording, there was a recent Uber breach and there's been many other in the last few weeks. And those almost all started with some sort of credential breach. And even when multi-factor is there, which it's alleged to have been there in the particular attack against Uber, um, it's not always perfect, but start with the remote access tools absolutely have to require it because this is more often than not where the criminals are coming in, whether it's attacking the VPN server or RDP itself or tool, through tools like Kaseya. Give your employees password managers, like telling them to have unique passwords on 35 different websites isn't working. Like clearly no human being is going to do that properly. Give them the tools they need to have half a chance to get it done. Even if it's free ones, you don't have to spend any money. Give them KeyPass, give them the free version of Bitwarden. Do something to enable them to do the right thing. And the, even if it's not all of them, if some of them start doing the right thing, you're still better off than, than uh, when they're not. Multi-factor, obviously, there's sort of a, a stack ranking of how effective they can be. The cheapest and easiest thing to do is those time-based tokens, the six digits like you see on the R RSA key. They're called top P. You know, that's better than nothing. And unfortunately, those are very easy to fish. So they're kind of easy for criminals to bypass these days. Uh, the next step up from there may be a commercial tool that does push notifications to your phone. Uh, most of us have experienced that with Apple and Google devices where you go to log into your Apple account, it pushes a thing to your iPhone, says press this button, is that you logging in? Commercially, of course, we use tools like Duo from Cisco that uh, enable push notification. It's another step better than just asking me for six digits. Ideally, for your really sensitive stuff, people with access maybe to your source code, access to your customer information, you really need to start thinking about harbor tokens like a YubiKey in the picture there. Ideally, um, that's going to determine what kind of access you get to the network. The super sensitive things need harbor tokens. The moderately sensitive things maybe use an app on your phone. And things that are less less uh, important may have no multi-factor at all or maybe just uh, the six-digit codes, that kind of thing. What we're starting to see now, unfortunately, is cookie theft bypassing multi-factor altogether. So more and more groups are using information stealing Trojans to steal the cookies from your browser. And if they can steal your Office 365 cookie, they don't need to use multi-factor. They can just log into 365 as you by just using the session cookie. So we're starting to publish a lot of research on that. I think at the moment it's not heavily exploited, but we're starting to see it being used more and more, uh, started by targeting YouTubers and gamers to get access to their accounts, but we're seeing more of it in the corporate space as well. You have to be threat hunting. And if you can't do it yourself, talk to your managed security service provider, talk to your vendors that help you buy IT equipment, see if they offer a service, talk to your security company like us or our competitors. We all offer services now. Somebody has to be out there looking. When, 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 when you hear the noise of the window breaking, that's the alert you're getting from your endpoint security product. The, you get the alert in the console saying, I detected agent Tesla dash X, Y on this computer. That doesn't mean your antivirus worked and that you just get to close the incident. That means you need to open an incident. You need to start investigating because it's unlikely that human attacker is going to give up just because the first thing they brought into your network was detected. They're going to keep trying more and more things until they're successful. So a, a good threat hunting organization is not just proactively looking for threats. They're investigating that sound of the glass breaking in the front door and going to check and see was this an incident? Do I need to repair the door? Did a criminal get in? And the challenge is just like those stormtroopers, you know, the criminals are dressed up like your own employee, right? They stole somebody's password. They're logged in as a legitimate user. So you really need to understand what how your network works and what your user behaviors are. So you can spot which of those stormtroopers is the one behaving oddly right? You got to find the odd stormtrooper. And the only way you're going to do that is if you're patrolling like those RCMP Canadian Mounties, since I'm Canadian, I had to include some Mounties in my, my images here. Um, you know, those Mounties are on patrol and they patrol that park every day and they know what normal things are going on. There's a yoga class in the corner of the park. There's a hot dog vendor in the other side of the park. They understand what normal is. And when you know what normal is, it makes it much, much easier to detect that which of these stormtroopers is not like the other one. And that's really the key to threat hunting. And, and if you're not being proactive in threat hunting, unfortunately, you're at the mercy of your products being perfect when we know they're not. And when we're facing human adversaries, they're always going to find a way around the product. So we really need to make sure that there's a human element on our threat protection side, because tools alone are just that. They're tools that need expert humans to operate them. So that concludes 
my presentation. I hope that information was helpful to you. I expect much of that advice is advice you've received before, but I wanted to put it into context for you about how criminals are actually using these techniques in the real world, because it's telling you to patch or telling people to have unique passwords everywhere is impractical advice if we don't understand where to apply it first and how to you know get a good start that's likely to give us the best protection from this beginning. And then we can progress to better and better as we continually improve, which all of us are doing, right? Security is a journey. There's no end point. And so uh, I hope that data is helpful for you to improve your security of your organization, your family, and maybe convince uh, your management to provide you the support you need to accomplish these goals. Thank you very much. Hack the planet.